All right, great. Uh, this meeting is called to order. It is uh, 931. This is the regular scheduled meeting of the Collection Service Board. Uh, let me read the notice of meeting into record. Uh, notice of J the January 13th, 2021 meeting of the Collection Service Board, including date, time, and location, has been noticed on the website since May 13, 2020. Additionally, this month's agenda has been posted on the website since December 23rd, 2020. Um, let me take roll right quick. Josh Holden. Present. Greg Swirsky. Present. Chip Hellman. Present. Great. Jason Hill. Present. And Tony Zikovich. Present. Great. All right. That's everybody. Uh, we do have quorum. Um, you, if you could read the statement of necessity into the record, please. Absolutely. Statement of necessity. According to TCA section 844108B2, if a physical quorum is not present at the location of a meeting of a governing body, the governing body must file such determination of necessity, including the resuscitation of the facts and circumstances on which it was based with the Office of Secretary of State no later than two working days after the meeting. Furthermore, TCA Section 844-108-A3 defines necessity as matters to be considered by the governing body at that meeting require timely action by the body. The physical presence by a quorum of the members is not practical within the period of time requiring action and that participation by a quorum of the members by electronic or other means of communication is necessary. This is the routinely scheduled meeting for the Tennessee Collection Service Board, and the purpose of today's meeting with the members attending by teleconference is to discuss the agenda as noticed on the website earlier. And to accept this statement of necessity, I just need a uh, motion to accept and a roll call vote if possible. Yes, sir. Thank you, Hugh. Um, gentlemen, as you know, anytime we have a remote meeting, we have to uh, read a statement of necessity into record, and then we have to do a, a roll call vote for all actionable items. Um, so if uh, you will accept the statement of necessity, uh, I'll just need a motion in that regard. Do we have a motion to accept the statement of necessity as read? Move, Swirsky. Second, Thank you. Chip. All right, great. We got a motion from Greg Swirsky to accept the uh, statement of necessity. We have a second from Chip Hellman. Um, for roll call vote, Josh Holden. Aye. Greg Swirsky. Aye. Chip Hellman. Aye. Jason Hill. Aye. Tony Zikovich. Aye. All right, great. That's been approved. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we'll get that filed with the uh, Secretary of State's office and um, uh, promptly within those two days. Uh, now for the agenda. Um, you should have the agenda as, as well as the other documents in front of you. Um, if that uh, if that will suffice, we'll just need a motion to accept. But if there's any edits or revisions, we'll entertain those as well. Do we have any edits or additions there? Okay, hearing uh, hearing none. Uh, do we have a motion to accept the agenda as uh, as written and posted? I move, Chip. All right, thank you, Chip. We've got a motion from Chip to accept the agenda as as posted. Do we have a second? Second, Swirsky. All right, thank you, Mr. Swirsky. We have a second from Mr. Swirsky um, for the agenda. For roll call vote, Josh Holden. Aye. Greg Swirsky. Aye. Chip Hellman. Aye. Jason Hill. Aye. Tony Zikovich. Aye. Great, thank you, gentlemen. That's uh, approved then. We'll get to uh, get on with the next uh, item on the agenda, and that's the November minutes. All right. Um, do we have any comments or edits or revisions to the uh, to the November minutes? Okay. Um, hearing none, then we'll accept a uh, we'll entertain a motion to accept the November minutes as written. Do we have such a uh, motion? Chip. Sure. All right. We have a motion from Chip to accept the no November mi minutes. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, good. I don't know if we have Greg or Josh there for the second. Like that was, let's give that one to Josh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thank Josh, is that a second? Josh Holden? Affirmative, Glenn. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. We have a, we have a motion from Chip Hellman and a second from Josh uh, Holden uh, to, uh, to accept the uh, November minutes for roll call vote. Josh Holden? Aye. Greg Swirsky? Aye. Chip Hellman? Aye. 
Jason Hill. Aye. Tony Zikovich. Aye. All right, great. Thank you very much. All right, before I get into director's report, let me take a just a brief second to introduce you to uh, Tony Zikovich. Um, he's our new public member. Um, he's, he's stepping in for uh, in, uh, in Bart's vacancy uh, rendered by his uh, by his uh, end of tenure, and um, he's coming to us uh, uh, by way of referral as well. And look forward to uh, working with him. Tony, did you have anything you want to say uh, to the to the rest of the board? No, I just wanted to uh, say hello to everyone, and I'm glad to be a part of the board. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. I look forward to your uh, contribution uh, over the. Uh, the next uh, couple of years. So uh, anyway, well, uh, of course, uh, you can reach out to any of uh, uh, you can reach out to myself and uh, the staff anytime you need and look forward to that interaction. All right. Thank you, Tony. Um, director's report then. OK. There is. Let's just start with the uh, with the budget. This is uh, you guys are no stranger to this. Tony, I may spend a little bit more time just for your benefit. Um, so you can look at how that's all uh, uh, separated there. We've got the revenues on top, licensing revenue. That's just what we bring in for our licensing. Uh, the state reg fee there is basically a um, it's a um, it's a reduction of revenue. It's not a true uh, expense. It's basically a counting term for a workaround. We use uh, fiscal finance administration. They print out our um, our licenses for a tune of about $5 per license. So that's a reduction of revenue there. But right below there, you have the uh, collections expenses. You have Edison expenses, which is basically our ledger. Um, it's basically uh, our, our platform for where we uh, have all of our accounts and expenditures there. So um, anything from salary to employees, to technology, um, to uh, things that, you know, paper, pens and rent and all that light bill, all those type of things uh, typically fall underneath the Edison expenses. And administrative cost backs basically mirror Edison expenses. Sometimes things don't fit nicely, ni nice and neat under Edison expenses, or sometimes administrative cost backs will result from the program share of total ex uh, uh, expenses as well. There's some things that don't directly, are directly related to the uh, program because we share space and the equipment and um, technology with other programs. So then that would be our proportion. And so uh, we find those same accounts and administrative cost backs in Edison uh, as well. Uh, legal cost backs are going to be um, when our attorneys, anytime they uh, touch our program, they charge us a billable hour for working the complaints um, and to uh, deal with like um, any rule amendments that we file with the legislator. Uh, they handle that and that's a billable hour. Um, investigations, field enforce enforcement, that would be if we were sending out inspectors or we're sending out a subject matter as expert to investigate a particular a particular case. Centralized complaints, customer service. That's one team. They are basically our call center. They're our first. They're our first line of contact for complaints and customer service. And then we just take our revenues, subtract our exp our expenditures, and at the very bottom we have the net surplus and deficit. Right below that is your historical data, so we can compare year end to year end, um, so we can track that month to month. Um, as you will all see. We're tracking in a, a total surplus um, right now of eleven thousand, which will add to our um, which will add to our reserve balance of um, eight ninety uh, eight ninety six. So we're we're in a really good place right now. Um, I do want to make one point. Uh, there's about two thousand in legal costbacks for July um, that were mistakenly appropriated to collections. And so that was corrected in September. So if you see the legal cost backs in July, a little high there, 7,000. And then uh, that was taken out in uh, sept, uh, looks like September. So you'll see a significantly lower cost of legal cost backs in September. So that correction was made. And, and anytime I see anything outside of the ordinary, um, outside of the historical trends, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look into that and um, have fiscal uh, do, do the research on that. And this is one, one of those uh, cases. But other than that, this is for informational purposes only. I don't see anything else that just popped out at me. Um, of course, I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Are there any questions in that regard? Okay. I know, I know we've talked about this before, but mm -hmm. in terms of the reserve, mm -hmm. um, that's really just a paper deal, right? I mean, I mean that's a hefty reserve mm -hmm. for a board of our size. 
Is there anything we need to know about that? No, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, we, uh, we're always up for um, um, sunset uh, hearings periodically, four to five years, depending on what the legislative government operations uh, committee gives us. And of course, they always dive into that that issue. Uh, they always want to know they, they want. Typically, they want a two year operational budget in reserves um, just so that you can handle it because you have to be basically you have to be if you're not solvent to uh, two years in a row, you have to come before them. Uh, and then you have to have that conversation again, a solvency hearing. So we always want to have about two years total there. Now we are in excess of that. Um, we're not, you know, we don't, uh, we're 896 would uh, certainly be north of that. Uh, when we get to, uh, there's certain thresholds for that when we get to um, where once we hit those thresholds, then we have to have conversations about um, licensing revenue uh, reductions, or sometimes that, that can be spent in training um, or it can be spent and you know, there's all a, a number of things that we can do with that. Uh, some of those options uh, could include right pretty think next next meeting on the 14th. We'll be talking about um, going to NMLS. Well, we may offset the cost for our licensees by coming out of the reserves. There's there, we always look at those type of options right now. We're not being too aggressive with that because um, those can also be uh, can be seized by the legislator. So um you know we're as we're entering into um uncertain times and there's 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 cuts and uh going across the board uh throughout state government we're monitoring that simultaneously too so it's kind of until we to, until we're on firmer ground and know what the fiscal horizon looks like it's really difficult to act in that environment so we're monitoring it um right now we're not in we're, we haven't reached those thresholds where um we're 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 adding a scrutiny to our program and to ourselves, but that, that's a great question. That's something that we always have to keep an eye on. We certainly, if we approach that 1 million mark, that would be when we need to aggressively uh, uh, have that conversation. So, uh, Glenn, just as a follow up question, when we switch over to M NMLS, mm -hmm. um, there will be a cost associated with that. And does this board have the authority to make a decision? such as um, the decision being that we'll spend some of that reserve money to make that transition and to make the transition easier on the companies we um, regulate? Uh, we can. Um, uh, just to give you sort of a snapshot, uh, any cost incurred to NMLS is, is, is basically it's $100 a year for companies to be a part of NMLS. And then twenty dollars per each state-specific license that they apply or apply for. Now we did do a search through NMLS for all of our companies, both debt management and collection service, and it was determined about ninety percent of our companies are already in NMLS. Okay. So there's no additional hundred dollars there because they're already paying it. They've got multiple license uh, license lines all across states and other states and here and and so they're already in NMLS. The largest majority of all of our folks are so there's minimal impact there so we're not talking about a huge sort of um you know expense for them we're looking at really twenty dollars and when you know when you're looking at okay. 350 350 dollars application fee 20 bucks on top of that they don't even blink at that right i guess the question was really meant to be a broader one mm -hmm. do we have the ability to oh. uh, use that fund uh, those reserves if something did come up that was yes, more yes sir yes sir we certainly okay. do all right that's great great question thank you all right some good questions here. i should have known from the finance uh guys that we would get some of these this uh with this board right so good, good questions <laughs> thank you all all right is there any other questions in regards to the um to the budget okay if not then we can um uh, move on um just a couple other items of note um if you could uh, bring out your uh, your calendars there, uh, we do have a scheduling conflict for the week of our next meeting on April 14th. Um, if you could look at your calendars and see if your schedule permit the next meeting to be the week before the 7th or the week after the 21st, um, I would entertain. Uh, I'll just give you a moment to do that. Is there one that you would have preference over the other, the 7th or the 21st? I'm good with either, Glenn. Right. Thank you, Tony. Tony. Yeah. Josh, what about you? 
you. Uh, either Good. either one is fine. If if uh, given the choice, I'd probably say April the seventh. But I can mm -hmm. I can accommodate either one, Director. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Mr. Hellman, what about you? Same. Exactly. Okay. I can do it. Okay. So we're. I'm thinking the seventh. Then um, Jason, uh, Mr. Hill, um, Mr. Swarsky, you're, you 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 both open with that one. I'm I'm good with the seventh. Yes. Okay. And I am as. Well. All right. Thank thank you, Mr. Hill. All right. We'll just uh, entertain a motion then to have that change to the the seventh since we've already voted on these dates uh, uh, last year. Do we have a motion to change our next meeting to April seventh? Motion by Josh. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Holden. We got a motion from Josh Holden. Do we have a second? Chip Hellman, second. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hellman. Uh, thank you for that second for roll call vote. Josh Holden. Aye. Greg Swirsky. Aye. Chip Hellman. Aye. Jason Hill. Aye. Tony Zikovich. Tony Zikovich. Oh, sorry. Aye. Oh. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. We'll get that changed on the uh, mark your calendars then for uh, April 7th. Uh, same time, same place. I imagine we'll still be on WebEx. So, um, I, you know, I don't foresee this uh, making any hard changes, uh, at least until maybe later on into the year. So, um, we'll be here then on the 7th and uh, I'll get that changed on the website for uh, for you as well. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Um, one more matter of just sort of housekeeping. Um, at our next meeting on the 7th, we'll need to do an election of officers. Uh, uh, 6220104E states that the board shall annually select from its members a chair, vice chair, and secretary, and no member of the board shall hold more than one such office. So uh, because that is statute, and um, we do have to do that every year, um, typically we do that the first meeting of the year. I didn't want to do that this meeting primarily because we have um, uh, Mr. Hill just joined us last meeting, and then um, we got uh, Tony Zikovich this meeting. So I want, and plus I want to give you sort of um, an opportunity to really think about that. The, these positions, as you know, are, are lar largely ceremonial. Uh, the, the chair now will often, if called upon by the government operations committee, uh, will, will provide representation to the board um, for follow up questions. So, you know, you want to be thoughtful about all the positions that we select. Um, I don't, we don't, we're not scheduled for any of such hearings this year, but sometimes things change. Um, you know, if we were to be, um, we were to be selected for audit or something like that. Sometimes uh, it can be a more of an active role, the chair, but they're they're primarily uh, ceremonial otherwise. So uh, be thinking about that, and then at ne next meeting we'll um, we'll take nominations for all three of those, uh, and then uh, make that selection. Um, all right, one more thing, just as I just wanted to bring before you as well as a matter of administration and to get your input. Um, it re it re it's in regards to renewal apps. Um, as it pertains to bankruptcies that show up on um, on the financial report. Um, as a prerequisite for renewal, all licensees must be financially responsible and not have filed a petition under the federal bankruptcy laws or state insolvency laws within the last seven years. That's in compliance with uh, TCA 6220-107. So uh, if an agency or their parent company because we've determined that there's no there's no difference in the two when making those type of considerations. If the agency or the parent company has filed chapter level uh, chapter 11 and there's no resolution or restructure plan, and that's the key. If there's no resolution or restructure plan, the board's uh, office, our administration has been and the opinion is that denial at that time is adequate until the situation is resolved. And so I just want to make sure that that is the, um, the under or that would be the position of the board as well. We're not saying um, once they have a renewal that that's a property right. So it, um, we uh, want to make sure that um, we adhere to TCA code and that uh, when it, when it um, implies insolvency. But yet, if there is restructure plan going on or a, uh, and there's a resolution, um, then that that would um, that would affirm that solvency is still maintained. Then we would be inclined to approve that. But if there is no uh, a resolution or a structure plan, then we would not. And uh, that's been the position of the administration. Just want to make sure that uh, that the board agrees. Is there any comments on that? I think it sounds very reasonable, Swarovski. Okay. Well, nothing for us to vote on. It's not an actionable item. Just I just wanted to make sure that anytime we're sort of set, uh, setting up uh, precedent. Um, 
and of course, it's something we've already been in discussion with with legal and Hughes online, obviously, to to answer any follow up questions. But um, it's not a major move on our behalf. Just wanted to make sure we always bring that before our experts. Any other comments or questions? Director, that's all. This is Josh. That's only in the context of a Chapter Eleven, correct? Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great, uh, great um, distinction. All right, and of course, obviously, under Chapter Eleven, that restructuring is permitted. So, we want to um, um, yield to that where where that's allowed. Okay. All right, that's it. That's all I had for that. Um, uh, the uh, NMLS uh, fees rule uh, and the and and the uh, the fees that will result from that those rules um, that will come at the next meeting on the the at, on April the seventh. We are moving towards NMLS, so I know it's been a long time coming for some of you that have been on the board for a while. We've had that discussion um, for quite some time, and so um, executive management's already green-lighted that, and so now we're, we're moving in that direction. And so we'll get those rules before you at the next meeting. All right, uh, Hugh. Stay ready for the legal report. All right, sounds good. Um, if everyone has the legal report pulled up here, uh, there are a total of 10 cases on this meeting's legal report. There are zero cases to be represented. Um, if you have any questions, uh, be sure to speak now. And um, if not, then at the end, uh, once the recommendations are locked in, then I will read the, the case number. Um, and the recommendation and the record. Uh, but in the meantime, just uh, review the legal report and please let me know if there are any questions. Uh, Director, this is this is Josh Holden. Let me ask counsel and also the rest of the board. I noticed that there are several instances here where the, we've reached out through through the staff through the through council uh, about expired bonds and that that hasn't been rectified so the proposed remedy is to send a letter of warning a 30-day letter of warning uh, and if no action is taken follow it up with a consent order and a 250 dollars civil penalty um, I, i'm just curious and i guess this question is directed to the other members of the board is there any appetite for uh, just proceeding straight to the civil penalty? I mean, it, you know, the, the requirement to have a bond is a statutory requirement. Um, it's it's there in black and white. I think everybody knows about it. You know, it sounds like they've had some communication as a reminder, as a courtesy already. Um, I, I just wonder if, if there's some concern that maybe it's too many bites at the apple to give them another another notice and another opportunity. Meanwhile, they're going w without a bond, um, which I think you know, does present a, a bit of a dangerous situation for them not to have a bond. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Members, did there, is there any comments in regards to that? I, I, I think Josh brings up a good point. I guess I would ask the staff, uh, if you feel like, based on your previous efforts to communicate, if you feel like people have been communicated adequately enough prior to the 30-day, the recommended 30-day notification, um, what, what does the staff feel? Not your opinion of it, but do you feel like you like beating your head against the wall, you notified them multiple times, and now you'd like for us to come out a little harder and just issue the penalty? The, thank you for that comment or that uh, question. Yes, Mr. Hellman, uh, we do before we um, before we present it uh, and open a complaint. Uh, we always, uh, you know, as you would suspect, do our due diligence. We usually send, uh, you know, we make a couple attempts at a letter, typically an email on file that sort of thing and and try to uh, make sure that we uh, uh, we they're they're properly noticed um, obviously it, it, it would be uh, and that shouldn't be too difficult because it would be the contact we have on file that filed the renewal or the initial so um, 
you know, typically uh, once we've exhausted that, then that's when it comes uh, before uh, before you folks do, because you know it's it's very it's very um, uh, costly to present a um, um, uh, to do uh, to, to 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 defer these to legal because we're of course being charged by the bill by hour there, and these have to be worked accordingly. So that is a last resort for us. So we've we've exhausted um, you know our known uh, methods of communication by the time they hit the legal report. If that helps. So said another way, uh, being just uh, finan fiscally conservative, financially conservative here, at this point we're spending money on these people, correct, with legal fees? That's correct. That's correct. So I think that supports Josh's question that at this point we should be potentially seeking the civil penalty or issuing the civil penalty because we're they forced us to spend money uh -huh. to try to ensure that they're bonded properly bonded so i guess josh what i'm saying to you is i could go with that if, if you feel strongly about it I, it feels like we go way out of our way here to try to help companies stay compliant at this point it's costing us money I think that's a fantastic point in that there's there's already a cost um, uh, for the for the for the board and the staff in terms of time and effort that has gone into it. So it would be nice to recoup some of that. Uh, the other side of it is it's, it's there's a reason that they're required to have the bond. It's it's statutory. It 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 uh, is there to protect the the public and, and to make sure that. Um, there, there's a there's a source of funds if they're doing something they shouldn't be doing, and, and there, there, that safety net is absent now. So, uh, I would I would advocate for um, on several of these. We can go through them one by one, but it looks like I, I I have confidence that multiple efforts have been made to reach reach these individuals. They we should have good contact information on file. Um, if we don't, that's that's their fault for not providing it. So I would. I would advocate for going straight to the, the civil penalty. It's a modest penalty. It's it's not not punitive. It's not particularly burdensome, but it will certainly help remind them next time of the importance of, of maintaining their bond. Okay. Oh, this is a Hugh speaking. I'd like to chime in if I could on this. Um, the reason for this recommendation is is twofold. Both both of the points were brought up already. Uh, one is the fiscal aspect of it. Um, the it's 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 a lot less costly um, time wise, and also financially for for legal to draft a letter of warning and uh, document that letter of warning as you know certified mail. Um, we know from a legal standpoint that it is that the licensee has received the letter. Which also helps going into a consent order, a consent order process, which would be actual, basically the first step before litigation. And litigation, there will be, you know, an expense for Tom, but all it's going to be more expensive uh, to pursue a two hundred fifty dollars civil penalty just based on a renewed bond and the. I think the main goal is that we want to have the renewed bond. That's what we're after. We're not really after trying to hammer folks with a fee. Um, so from a fiscal aspect, it it, it made sense to me um, to provide that last letter of warning because it's cheaper financially, uh, but also because it built, it helps build that case. Um, so if we do move into a consent order and move into litigation and the the judge ask about notice and chances, if we had a letter of warning on file, it will increase uh, that argument that, you know, we've, they, these weren't just emails sent or phone calls. This was an actual letter of warning from the legal department putting these folks on notice that the next step would be a consent order with a $250 civil penalty, which makes that argument stronger. Um, and on the other side of that, 
is since what we're after is the renewed bond, if, you know, these licensees get the letter of warning and they provide us with the renewed bond, then that's really what we're after. Um, so in terms of, you know, the fiscal side of things, it's this process is a little bit more drawn out being that there's an extra 30 days there. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a uh, financially, you know, a good move because it's, it's less work on the front end, but it, it also accomplishes the, the end goal that we're after. We have any sense for how many people go ahead and present the bond after getting this letter? I know this has been pretty standard practice. I don't know if we've ever looked at it as a board, but I well, from a legal standpoint, um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I really wanted to hear you on it. Okay. Yeah, from a legal standpoint, um, I've presented a few cases like this, um, and they've been, you know, closed out because this, you know, the letter gets through and the, for whatever reason, the, the applicant or the licensees are not getting the communication from the program or I, you know, I, I don't want to speculate as to what exactly is going on there, but, you know, for the most part, these folks are probably trying to comply that something's come up, something's, you know, administratively on their end has gotten in the way. And um, I can go, you know, from the legal department, you can go into the Secretary of State's office and find a registered agent. We can make sure from a legal standpoint that these folks get this letter, whereas I can't really track down the program's emails. I mean, they can provide me a copy with it. Uh, you know, I don't really have any sort of recorded phone calls. It just, and a judge is really going to go through all of that. Um, I think that the letter of warning, if we send it from the legal department and these folks do not respond, then I, you know, there's really no other option but to pursue uh, a consent order in the formal hearing. Whereas at this point, what we really want is the renewed bond. And if there's a way that we can guarantee that that the licensee has should be aware that that we need that renewed bond without you know the additional expense of going straight into litigation. Uh, I think I think that's a good option. Uh, I do I do think it's a it's a suitable option uh, to to pursue the consent order as well if 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 that's what we're after. Um, I guess for I guess the board just really. You know, maybe consider whether if what we really want is just the renewed bond or if we want to consider, I mean, to pursue the civil penalty. I, I could be wrong, but my, my presumption would be that that the board would be after the renewed bond. Um, and that's sort of the, the basis for this recommendation, because in the other issue is that we're going to be getting more and more of these. Um, so it's it's sort of being that these are administrative complaints; these are not opened by a consumer. Um, I, it it feels uh, a good it feel, it seems to be a good idea to pursue this administratively, exhaust all administrative remedies prior to moving into litigation for a renewed bond. Um, Hugh, if you don't mind me interrupting for just a second. Uh, and I think it uh, sounds like we're all on the same page. Uh, it appears, and, and this has been an ongoing problem, uh, Mr. Holden and Chip, you guys especially that have been on the board for a little while. Service has always been an issue. Um, so program, our resources are going to be the, the, the information they give us on file. So we're going to reach out to the address or to the, the contact person, the email that they provide that we have on file. You know, and legal. There, and, and the program is not going to spend money on certified mail for every letter we send out. Obviously, that would be cost prohibitive. So we we right. just wouldn't do that. Um, and so legal has that option. And then they're going to go to the registered agent at the Secretary of State's office. So that's one extra level. Uh, I think a lot of our situation, I'm interested to see once we go in MLS, where, you know, we might be able to go straight to the to the 250. Because I agree with you. If I mean, if somebody is just sort of disregarding our, our notices, um, then the 250 uh, obviously is is appropriate, and I think Hugh is saying at that point that we're not so sure that maybe they are or not. We can't say definitively that they are, um, 
And so uh, that's why he was wanting to go the extra rates, uh, that, ex that extra that extra step. I do think a lot of this will be resolved with NMLS because service isn't a question. You know, we reached out right. to you, you know, on NMLS. That's the registered authorized agent because you're in the portal. So there's no way of saying, no, I didn't get it. I don't know what you're talking about. Dog ate my homework. None of that's happening, you know. Right. So I think we'll move into so, a new environment then. So is it your recommendation that we just hold hold the line here and do what we've always done until we get live with NMLS and see if that changes this issue? I think it decision? would. I definitely think it would be a, a it would be a new information and a new environment that could certainly uh, it would also it would sort of give us a, a baseline then. Um, so. Uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, it's the board's authority to do whatever they, it's, you know, I wouldn't, uh, you know, infer otherwise. It would be your authority to, if you want to go straight for the 250 or you're more than welcome to do that, that's definitely well within your authority. Um, but if you wanted to lean towards the council's recommendation uh, until we get into MLS, that's also another option. So, and I don't know that we really explained in those terms and until now. Um, so your comments, Josh, we welcome that. Josh, are you? okay with waiting until we go live with them NMLS where probably we can assure receipt of our notices through the portal and just see if that sort of clears this up. Chip, yeah, I think that's probably a good idea. Hugh's comments and Glenn's comments are well taken. And so there is benefit to sending out the notice. Maybe that's something we keep in the back of our minds going forward. And, and Hugh, you may want to weigh in on that maybe at the next meeting or thereafter, but you know, if it's going to continue to be a problem, how do we put more teeth in, either into the letter or into the uh, consent order? Do we increase the dollar amount? Do we shorten the duration instead mm -hmm. of 30 days, make it 15 days? Things like that. Maybe let's see what happens with NMLS. If it continues to be a problem, then how do we um, how do we how do we alter it a little bit to sort of coerce compliance? So. I'm fine with that. Based on Hugh and Glenn's comments, I'm fine with council's recommendation. Okay. Yeah. Great okay. discussion. You guys have always uh, yeah. really good about uh, giving us some perspective to help, you know, sort of stretch us and improve our operations always. So thank you. Absolutely. And, and, and Glenn, directly to Hugh's question, it is the board's desire that we get compliance, not to be issuing $250 fees. I mean, all we care about is that people have the bond. And right. So that is the goal. So, okay, no question. And of course, you know, sometimes the those uh, fees, so uh, civil penalties, can uh, to the Holden's, uh, Josh Holden's point, can so provide that that incentive, can sort of incentivize that 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 uh, cooperation. So all of those things are tools in the in your in your toolbox that you can uh, bring forward. But it, that sounds like we're, we've come to a place of consensus. So that's good. Is there any other questions in regard to the rest of the report? No, from Chip. Okay. Um, then uh, what we'll do then, uh, Hugh, if you want to just read uh, each each one, uh, just the number and then what the recommendation was uh, into the record, and then we'll do a vote at the end. Absolutely. Case number one, 2020 the recommendation. Letter of warning if proof of renewed bond is provided within 30 days. Otherwise, consent order with a $250 civil penalty, proof of bond, and authorization for formal hearing. Case number two, 2020 Recommendation, letter of warning if proof of a renewed bond is provided within 30 days. Otherwise, consent order with a $250 civil penalty, proof of bond, and authorization for formal hearing. Case number three, 2020 recommendation, letter of warning if proof of a renewed bond is provided within 30 days, otherwise consent order with a $250 civil penalty, proof of bond, and authorization for formal hearing. Case number four, 2020 recommendation, close. Case number five, 2020 recommendation, close. Case number six, 2020087451, recommendation close. Case number seven, 2020084671, recommendation close. 
Case number 8-2020-085391, recommendation closing flag. Case number 9-2020-091711, recommendation close. Case number 10-2020-088671, recommendation close. All right, there doesn't appear to be any case to be uh, represented. So uh, we, uh, if that um, squares with what the desire of the board, then uh, we'll entertain a motion to accept uh, the, those recommendations as read. We have such a uh, motion. So moved by Josh. All right, thank you, Mr. Holden. Well, do we have a second? Mr. Swirsky, second. All right, thank you, Ms. Swirsky. All right, for roll call vote then, Josh Holden. Aye. Greg Swirsky. Aye. Chip Hellman. Aye. Jason Hill. Aye. And Tony Zikovich. Aye. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll get that uh, taken care of then. Thank you for um, for your contribution in that regard. Um, Hugh, did you have anything else uh, for the, le the legal section? I do. I, I just wanted to follow up uh, from the last meeting. We were discussing collection fees um, and sort of the parameters there, what charges are permissible, as well as the what sort of notice itemization of charges is typically required. Um, you know, we went over this uh, last meeting, uh, but I just kind of wanted to reiterate sort of what I found on the statutes and the rules and um, just follow follow up on this with the board, uh, if that would be okay. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I think Chip, you asked that question at the last meeting. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you. Well, have to dig in. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Okay. So for the what charges are permissible? Um, now we mentioned this last meeting as well, but you know, collection agencies, we, you know, you can't just add fees arbitrarily, and overall are limited in charges that can be added against a debtor. Um, so, you know, it's more. The, st the rules of statutes appear to be more exclusionary than than include. In other words, the, you know, the, the agency is not allowed to add interest or, or any other fees unless the debtor agreed to those fees in the underlying agreement with the creditor or the fees are committed by law, which is sort of what I was saying last meeting. Um, and that that means we have a rule on, specifically on point, and that's 0320-05-.06. And it's saying that the agency cannot collect interest, fee, charge, or expense incident, incidental to that principal obligation unless it's expressly authorized by the agreement creating the debt in the first place. Um, so there's that. And also, um, agencies can generally only seek a fee, commission, or other compensation from the client or the person or entity who retain the agency services per 62102. So we have a statute on there and are prohibited from collecting or attempting, attempting to collect from the debtor any fee commission or other compensation for collection services rendered to a client except that an agency may recover reasonable charges from debtors imposed by banks for processing insufficient fund checks so long as those charges do not exceed nine dollars per check and there's another statute on point there at 62 21 15. um and then also in terms of the notice and itemization that's required, I mean, we all know this, but the collection agencies must provide notice of debt that includes clearly identifying the name of the collection agency, the name of the creditor to whom the debt is owed, and the amount of the debt owed. And all of that is generally contained in the verification letter. Um, and that's that. there's a rule on point there, and that's 0320-05-07. Um, so th that's that's sort of the gist of it. Um, I hope that's helpful. Um, yeah. um, I, I, just a few questions or just mm -hmm. follow up questions, I guess. Clearly, I don't think any of us in, in this industry would believe that you could add any sort of collection fees without some sort of sign underlying agreement with the creditor but are you saying that you didn't really find anything in the state law that would prevent that from happening provided there was a an executing underlying credit agreement of some sort 
Well, there's, you know, it would have to be reasonable, um, you know, and, and not punitive, but uh, there's also, you know, federal statutes on point too that, that uh, could come into play if, if a collections agency is just charging, you know, sort of arbitrary fees in the underlying agreement. Um, I mean, I, I can look into that specifically if, if you'd like, but, I, you know, I, the, the, the statute, the state statutes seem to be focused on the, um, but they also seem to be focused on adding interest and fees, uh, just overall. Um, so I, I okay. you know, I, I think the main goal of the collection agency would be to recuperate whatever balance is owed from the, from their client. Um, and any fees on top of that charge to the debtor, you know, or is, I, th I think, I think the, I think the box is kind of small there for that. Okay. Uh, I, I agree. And it's generally, I would say generally no one adds fees. I mean, the vast majority of collection companies do not add fees. Let's put it that way. Uh, from time to time, though, we run into competitors who have convinced a creditor that they shouldn't have to pay collection fees because they do have an underlying credit agreement that was signed by the consumer. And so what I'm hearing is you haven't found anything at the state level necessarily that would prohibit it, but the FDCPA or some other federal laws may. Mm -hmm. I think that that's right. Okay. Uh, and the maximum NSF fee is $9, um, which I've made note of. By the way, I don't think anyone on this call, and I'm not necessarily aware of anybody that I'm concerned about in our industry doing all these things or any of these things, but I just, it comes up periodically, and I'm asked, you know, periodically, I'm sure Greg is when he's out there, well, agency B up the road says, I won't pay any fees if I work with them, because they're just going to add their fees onto the bill. Um, and so it's a com place of companies that don't add fees, maybe at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, and then one last question. Those are all just comments, I guess. But uh, was there any mention of convenience fees? That's another sort of sticky uh, place where agencies will add fees um, for taking payments over the phone or credit card payments or any number of ways that agencies do that. Did you find anything in there regarding convenience fees? I did not. Uh, not convenience fees in particular. I just, they, you know, they, convenience fees may be included within, you know, the language where they say other fees. Uh, the word fees is used a few times. Um, other fees is also used. So that, you know, an argument could be made that a convenience fee would probably fall in the sort of general uh, other fees language that's in the statute. At the federal level, convenience fees are addressed pretty head on that you have to offer any consumer free alternative. Um, so if you call our office to make a $100 payment on your hospital bill, and we, and if we were to charge a $5.95 convenience fee, we have to also explain to you, but if you want to just mail us a check, there'll be no convenience fee. I just wondered if there was anything in the state statute about that. I, I, I didn't know. I didn't see anything in particular on that. Um, yeah, but I, I can okay. certainly circle back next meeting if you like and you know, look for that. Look for convenience fees in particular. Well, I don't want you to spend a lot of time on it, but oh no, again, I, I don't think it would take that much time. Uh, I, I, okay. I think we're all. As consumers, we're all kind of used to paying convenience fees. You know, you call the AT&T to pay your cell phone bill 
you know, creditors stack on convenience fees pretty routinely. Um, what I worry about is third party space getting hammered for something that's generally considered a reasonable practice for non collection agencies. Anyway. All right, good, good stuff. Um, Oh, well, then um, we'll look into that, of course. And when I say we, I, I mean Hugh. Thank you, Hugh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Glad to do it. <laughs> Thank God. And I appreciate you uh, digging in that, Hugh. You've always been, uh, he's always been uh, great uh, for administration when we have questions as well. And so I just uh, appreciate his hard work and, and, and rolling up the sleeves and digging into some of those uh, those nuances. So, um, but this is a, this is a constantly changing uh, um, uh, industry. So, um, I appreciate all your subject matter experts bringing these things to our attention too, um, so that we can have the discussion as things come before us periodically through the work week. So thank you. Absolutely. All right. Um, I, unless we have any other business, I think we can move on to the next uh, the next section, which is the new business. Does any member have any new business that they would like to discuss or would like to entertain introduce? I, I, this is Sporsky. I, I don't have anything really new, but I, I did notice. And maybe I missed something. We had talked about getting a number or list of licensed agencies in the state at the last meeting. I didn't know if anything had been done on that. Oh, you just you would like a list of those. Uh, we we had the number. I didn't know that you wanted a list. I can certainly uh, get you a list of those agencies. That that's no problem. Um, but yes, uh, I can't remember. I don't believe it was my, actually my question. I just was reading through the minutes all that time. But, uh, the number's probably probably good enough. Um, I forget what it was. I um, I think it's in the in the, on the uh, the minutes. There was 112, I believe. If I'm I'm just guessing. It's been a while. Let me take a look right quick. We touched on that. Um, and of course, the, as if anyone was to was to submit a public records request, we could give you the exact uh, the exact number as well as um, the uh, contact information. Some folks will do that for mailing list or whatever. Uh, so the, uh, the, and the, the only reason I was asking is you know, I'm a board member of the American Collectors Association and in our membership drive, we're just trying to, you know, get a handle on how many uh, licensed agencies are not members of ACA just for, uh, gotcha. you know, for industry uh, you know, numbers and trying to get new membership. Uh, we have we have boards all the time um, that will uh, uh, they they well, they want to track those numbers and that's important information because you want to see if you're in decline or or or, or otherwise. So uh, but Ooh. right now we're sitting at eight eight twelve. This was the last number from uh, from the meeting. And, and if anybody wants a contact list, uh, you can just of course file that public records request and we'll get we'll open that up. It doesn't take that long at all, and we can get that to you. That'd be awesome. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Is there any other uh, any other new business or any other questions that uh, from the board? All right. Uh, hearing none, then we'll, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Do we have a a motion to adjourn? So moved, Chip. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hellman. We got a motion to adjourn from uh, Chip Hellman. Do we have a second? Second, Josh. Thank you, Mr. Holden. For roll call vote then, Josh Holden. For roll call vote to adjourn, Josh Holden. Aye. Uh, Greg Swirsky. Aye. Chip Hellman. Aye. Jason Hill. Aye. And Tony Zikovich. Aye. Thank you. We are adjourned. Gentlemen, you have a good rest of the day. You too. Thanks. Thank you. you too. Happy health day. You too. Thanks, sir. Thank <laughs> you.